First of all, uh, thank you for coming this evening. Uh, welcome to Wharton San Diego's event on data mining and predictive analytics. My name is Paul Gaspar. I am a uh, Wharton 98 MBA, um, and I serve on the uh, board of uh, the Wharton Club of San Diego. Um, I am the uh, principal of Gaspar Advisors, which is a consultancy that focuses on uh, software and services uh, growth strategy. We are inundated <clears throat> with data. I don't know about you all, but I personally you know, find that I struggle with just the massive amounts of information that come, after, come at me day after day. Um, and you know, my, my case is not uh, uh, unique by any stretch. Um, this deluge of data, as it's been coined, is uh, driven by the rapid changes in how we interact communicate and function in a world that is increasingly connected, both people and things, with the internet. The amount of data that's being collected is growing at an explosive rate. In 2010, data collected was equivalent to cumul the cumulative of previous 5,000 years worth of data, and it supposedly is doubling every two years. Consider this. Facebook has 30 petabytes of data 30 billion pieces of content are shared each month. YouTube uploads 35 hours of video every minute. Twitter delivered 25 billion tweets in 2010. Zynga generates 15 terabytes of data a day. None of these companies existed seven years ago. So we have companies that have far more data than ever before. Does this really create a new paradigm? We've had companies that have had large you know, data sets for years. Um, I've heard, you know, through my own industry experience, oh, you know, our marketing department has all this information, never makes any use of it. Um, you know, we have all this data. Are we really going to transform the way we do commerce? Um, what's different now? Are we just dealing with more noise, or are we actually kind of utilizing these uh, large, massive data sets uh, to generate value. So to get the, the discussion started, here's sort of the changes that, that I've observed. First is the, the, the availability of data. Um, the exponential growth in data is available to everyone, both companies and individuals alike. And you see kind of the icons up there and you kind of understand what's driving what I would, what I would what I've heard characterizes the democratization of data, right? You can go on to, to, uh, to Twitter and gain access to the data feeds. That's sort of you know, what led to Twitter's fantastic success, is that they opened the data feeds to developers and allowed them to uh, build applications off of the information that was being generated through the Twitter network. Um, next, you have sort of tools. Um, you know, you, you have <clears throat> data storage and processing infrastructure are becoming increasingly powerful at, at fraction, <coughs> fractions of the cost. You have open source software, you have collaboration platforms, you have cloud infrastructure that are providing mechanisms for not only collecting and sorting the data, uh, excuse, excuse me, collecting and storing the data, but also processing the data. <coughs> Bottom line, the, the infrastructure that is being offered by these entities um, in combination with open source projects and, and products are making data capture and analysis orders of magnitude cheaper, enabling innovation in almost every sector of the economy. My last point here is about investment. Markets, at least in today's world, seem to be rewarding companies on the promise that they will find value in the massive data sets that they create. I don't know if you guys have looked at this recently, but you know, if you look at sort of Twitter, Zynga, Facebook, I mean, the, the, the valuations are astronomical. I mean, I just sort of did some back of the envelope, and the entities that I mentioned, you know, we're talking about, you know, anywhere between 30 and 50 times revenues, okay? That's sort of the valuations that these guys are running at. Now, you remember lowly Apple? It's trading at 12 times earnings, okay? So, clearly, you got a lot of people betting on the come that you know these huge data sets can be monetized, and so um, that is sort of what I see as being some of the major changes. And what the way I'd like to kind of kick this off is I'd like to kind of ask the panel as a whole to share their observations on you know, what's changed between 
uh, you know, back then when we, you know, we have, you know, there, there are analytic-based competitors. They've been doing it for years. Um, Stephen, you know, you, you've been in the financial services industry, which was one of the pioneers in using uh, analytic methods to, uh, to transform industry practice. Um, what's changed? I think you've laid this out very well. I think, you know, I, to me, I think there's there's three fundamental things. It's the explosion of data that you described very well. It's the uh, uh, the Moore's Law and the ever-increasing hardware capabilities, which you've also addressed here, and the interconnectivity associated with that. But, and, but then also it's, the, uh, it's the, the, the sophistication, increasing sophistication of analytics and tools that we use to uh, operate on this massive data to transform it into actionable intelligence. And that, uh, again, it's not, it's, not, it's not fundamentally new, it's just, it's just constantly increasing, just uh, as, as in, in an exploding way as these other uh, uh, foundational things. Yeah, we definitely, um, from what we see from our customers, and Terry has been you know, in the business of big data for 32 years. So um, actually, we don't like the term big data necessarily because we don't think it's representative of what's really going on. Certainly, it is big, and there's a lot of data volume. Uh, in fact, depending which study you believe, uh, sometime in the middle of 2010, we, we left the petabyte edge, uh, I'm sorry, the exabyte era, and now we're in the zettabyte era. And, and what's even more interesting is that there's more data being created this year than can be stored physically. So there's a lot of stuff that's just going away. And you look at that and you say, well, that's really interesting, and it's certainly good if you're a storage provider. Uh, but, <laughs> right? but, but so what, right? Um, we think it's, it's actually uh, more about um, the, the variety of data. So, um, you know, traditional analytics and traditional data processing and databases and those kinds of things tended to be transactional-based data, rows and columns, and very organized. And, and the kinds of data that we're seeing now are very varied and very different. And so it's a complete paradigm shift where in the traditional sense you would have a bunch of data, you would do a data model, you would load it into tables, and then you would run some analytics, and that's really interesting. In this new world, you actually may never know what the data model is, and you may not care. Um, so the way the data are structured, and people say unstructured data, which for purists is also an oxymoron because all data are in fact structured, but uh, uh, polystructured and diverse structured data, things that are not traditional rows and columns and transactions are, are really, we think, the paradigm shift. It also happens to be large volume, and it happens to be large velocity. And so it's the triangulation of all those pieces that I think is creating new industries, new opportunities for, uh, for analytic delivery. Um, and it's also, I think, creating problems for industry. Right? Um, it was hard enough to get our arms around ERP transactional data to make real-time decisions for uh, for our businesses and how to drive it. You know, how are we possibly going to get our arms around this other stuff that is like completely different? And uh, and I think the winners, and I think you know what will define our industry, and we'll find ten years from now if we're all sitting here and talking about it, the winners will be the ones that figured out what's the important part of that, how to capture it, and how to process it efficiently and turn it into real business value and take all the noise away. Great, so I couldn't agree more. Uh, hopefully the audience isn't disappointed that we're not bringing an argument here. But <laughs> we'll come up with something controversial. Okay, first. great, great. Um, but the one thing I'd add is I, I think um, on two fronts, talent is really increasing in this area. So both at the senior executive level, like. You know, 20 years ago, the senior executives might have said, let's just throw this stuff away. Who cares, right? And now they know to ask. They're, they, they know they've seen the success in the financial industries and, um, you know, even the baseball stuff gets people really excited. And, and so the people in the C-suite know that they should be asking these questions now more than ever. And I think also at the junior level, the talent, you know, it just amazes me what walks in the door. You know, you get because we have all these open source tools, you have kids in high school or first year of college who are playing around with them and you go, I have this unstructured data, but there's this one thing I want to pull out of it. Will you go write me a script? I don't even know in what language to, to go get it. And they come back in three hours and they've got the, you know, they've pulled out the piece you need. And there's also kind of a, a trend across universities, and I like to think that Wharton is a leader in this, in creating curriculum to really feed that talent. So, and, and make sure that, that we get junior analysts coming out who 
kind of understand the big picture and can you know get down to the nitty gritty and take care of the details as well. And and you know as that talent gets cheaper, more and more companies will be interested in, in having a big push in this area. Yes, Scott mentioned uh, structured versus unstructured. That's one good way to uh, to categorize data. And of course, there's a continuum in between. You could even have the philosophical point that all data is structured, but um, regardless, we're <laughs> Uh, it, it's not so important, but generally there are those two broad categorizations of data. More and more is unstructured these days with video and voice and, and, and text and, and, and song, music, uh, sound. Um, so it's become more and more important to be able to have tools that can operate on that unstructured data. The other general categorization that can, have, that can be done in this, in this field is the, the use of the data. And I'd say there are two primary categories of use. One is, is search and retrieval, present the right things for, for queries and requests. And the second is for modeling and prediction, forecasting and prediction, uh, making, making predictions of what's going to happen. Those are two related but somewhat but different categorizations of, of the tools that we do with data, or the purposes that we do with data. I think the, the, the talent point that you brought up is a really good point, too. You know, we're definitely seeing. Um, in this market, and there have been some articles recently uh, about this topic, um, a shortage of this talent, right? And part of it is due to the, the huge growth, and also part of it is that it's an intersection of multiple curricula that uh, kind of have to intersect. And it takes a very special person or people to kind of uh, hit that intersection properly, and I do think that uh, that's an important thing for uh, for academia, and it's an important thing for industry to help academia with as well in terms of building out that curriculum. You know, in, in, uh, in today's uh, economic climate and uh, job market, we're actually finding that students are asking professors that we're affiliated with, how do I get into this business? Because I know I'm going to have a job for 20 years and it's going to pay well. I mean, there is that kind of pent up demand. And, uh, and I think we definitely need to go solve that problem uh, so that we can create those enabling technologies and, and, and really drive the value out of it. And it, it's satisfying to the students. So the, the students see, you know, especially the students coming out of computer science, see this as a way that they can be whispering in the ears of princes, so to speak. Like if I'm the analyst, I'm going to get a lot of visibility um, because I'm basically helping provide the answers to the senior leader. So a lot of the students get very excited about that, like combining their passion for their technical work that you know they been building up since they were in third grade or something. And, and every day your job is different, right? Because you get right. more analytic and then that creates a thousand more questions to go answer. So. It's definitely a great field. And there is, I, I, I can't hire fast enough in, in this field. And I, I find people who, who make, and people can make the transition into machine learning even after post PhD. I did. So, uh, you know, I, physicists make good modelers, uh, computer science, uh, engineers, mathematicians. Uh, even people with psychology degrees uh, can become good modelers. It just takes it takes good intuition, uh, passion for data, uh, good mathematical skills, and very good programming skills. So, but there's definitely a need for more and more uh, people with this expertise. I'd like to step back to the uh, the challenge that you both pose or all of you pose uh, with regard to you know the the winner is going to be the one who can find the most useful pieces. Um, extract those. Um, Ellie, perhaps you could speak to, uh, you know, in your experience, um, you know, if you sort of see companies who have successfully begun to do this, a, um, and, and if, if it tends to focus on a particular discipline. And where I'm going with this is that, you know, Wharton chose um, customer analytics um, as sort of a, a, a focus or a discipline. And, you know, I see many people in the room here who, um, you know, while they are interested in optimizing customer acquisition and retention, and it's naturally very important to just about any enterprise that's out there, um, there's a lot that goes on on the optimization side, right? And, um, you know, I, I have some friends that are sitting out there that uh, are in the insurance space, for instance, and they think about, well, you know, how can you use decision analytics to perhaps streamline claims management or, um, you know, uh, it's being done to large degree to, in, in the underwriting space. Perhaps you could speak to that um, or those topics. So let me talk a little bit about why customer analytics. Um, and I think what I have to do is clarify what we mean by customer 
So sometimes we're actually getting coffee mugs made. I'm, they're not ready yet, or I would have brought some for it. Um, but they say people doing stuff over time, which is essentially, you know, when we define customer, it's about people. And we think the people part is important because um, I don't claim to be able to predict stock prices or, you know, uh, what, how trees will grow. I know how to model people. And, um, and they're doing all kinds of stuff over time. So it, it could be that they're choosing to acquire a new product, but it could be that they're calling into the call center because they're having some kind of service problem with their product. Um, and so we're really kind of agnostic about um, what the behavior is, the stuff that people are doing. Um, and then we apply it to basically, you know, everyone asks me, what, are, what kinds of decisions can you apply customer analytics? Well, that has a really sort of age old you know, the teacher in me comes out. Do you remember your intro marketing class? What are the four marketing decisions? <laughs> the P's, do you remember? Does anyone remember? Everyone remember? Raise yeah. your hand if you remember what the four P's are. So, you know, the four P's, you, you're bringing up the, the P that everybody thinks of first, which is promotion, right? How do, we, how do we get the right advertising messages to people and get them to adopt? But all of this stuff can be applied to all the other four P's. So, for instance, the P that I'm most passionate about is product. I've been a product person, you know, product service um, improvement person my entire life, and um, we actually have a project with my old employer, General Motors, and uh, they want to know how to do text mining of social networks in China to understand what people are looking for in a car, just to make the cars better. So, you know, it doesn't have to be about acquiring that new customer. It can be about any of those four P's. What should the price be? Um, you know, where should we be selling it? What channels should we be selling it through? You know, you can apply the same predictive modeling techniques to those kinds of problems that you would, you know, we're not, not specifically acquisition or promotion focused. I, I would say that, you know, we talked about consumer modeling is one of the foundational applications of, of behavioral analytics. And I love it too. I have, I have a passion for consumer modeling. I, I consider consumers irrational creatures. And I've had an argument. I had an argument with the uh, head of marketing for Procter & Gamble, Global Marketing, and she said that she believed that people are rational. <laughs> and I, I just, I mean, I fundamentally disbelieve that. I think that people make, people make decisions for reasons, but they're not necessarily rational reasons. You know, there's, there's actually a lot of behavioral econometrics uh, uh, research on that. Kahneman and Tversky, for example, did a lot of research on that. So anyway, under, modeling how people behave is, is fabulous. It is, it is a, a really, really cool thing to do because they're generally irrational and you're never, you never, know, you just try to get statistically right more than you, you are wrong in, in order to provide business value. Other applications are, uh, that don't deal with people or directly are things like optimization for facilities management, for uh, call routing, for staffing. There's a lot of op general optimization problems for, uh, for modeling and analytics. And then there's uh, kind of generic forecasting too. You mentioned stock prices and all the, all the things that all the bad things that are around stocks, commodities and options and derivatives and things like that and being able to price those on a variety of different time scales. And then the optimizations that go around that like asset allocation. So there's, there's tons of, of wonderful applications for uh, for uh, for analytics and machine learning that, that are beyond uh, consumer modeling, we're seeing um, a lot of examples of that as well. I mean, certainly consumer and social network is a big buzzword in the industry, and that and that's interesting. But some of the same tools and algorithms that you use for that, uh, we're seeing our customers apply to other tasks like uh, advanced fraud detection, going kind of beyond looking at. Um, consumers and transactions and actually following the funds to see if they end up at the same place they started. It's an interesting graph analysis. It's hard to do in traditional data, but it's very easy to do with these new tools. Uh, we're seeing a lot of machine-generated data, whether it be smart grid uh, kinds of meters that um, some of us have in our homes now, although they don't work when the power goes out. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, smart grids or even uh, sensor data from uh, from uh, you know, expensive capital equipment like jet engines. So a jet engine running an hour creates a terabyte of sensor information. And that's really interesting information. I, I was meeting with an editor from Forbes talking about this one time, and he got really angry with me. He said, don't use an emotional thing. You know, the jet plane's not gonna crash. I said, no, that's not the point. It's all about economics. A jet engine is really expensive. The parts are really expensive. If you can predict when it's gonna fail and fix it a minute before it fails with a part that you only ordered a minute before that, that saves a lot of money. And those kinds of algorithms are very interesting as well. Mm -hmm. So 
and, and you might not think that all that sensor data from you know jet engine traveling across the country is really interesting. But being able to parse through it and find those patterns and recognize those patterns actually has economic value. Mm -hmm. and, you know, just to, it always comes down to there has to be some business decision that's going to be made. Mm -hmm. And you've got to start with the, you know, I, I almost take a little bit of offense to starting with the data. Because it's not about the data, it's about the decision. So, you know, what is the decision that needs to be made? Whether it's I need to repair the jet engine, or I need to know when to repair the jet engine, or I... I need to know how to tailor this service to the customer so she really enjoys it. You know, all the, it, it, there has to be some sort of basic underlying business um, decision. I've seen companies waste a lot of time, energy, and money on, we're just going to mine the data without any sense of where they're going with it. Or Have, have you guys ever seen a successful case where a company's just like, we're just gonna look at the data and see what happens? Well, generally, business analysts have a, 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 at least a, a general idea of what questions they wanna ask, generally. And uh, of course, there's always, you know, there's the data warehouse debacles, you know, where you spend, uh, you know, a hundred million dollars and you build this huge data warehouse, and by the time it's done, it, uh, it, it, it's the wrong machine, the wrong the wrong thing, or, or it was not built to answer the right questions. I think that that's a, more to the point. These are the data that's in there is not in the right form or it's not accessible in the right time frame. Or, uh, but generally I think people who, who accumulate <coughs> data have, a broad, have a, general, a, a broad idea of what kind of questions they're going to ask. But absolutely, uh, the questions are the, mo are the place to start. Mm -hmm. So I want to go back to, uh, I want to go back to uh, the buzz of social media. Because to me it seems like um, I'm curious, have you found companies in your collective experience that have used the social media data effectively, or is it, you know, oh, we've got a fire hose of data, let's figure out what to do with it, i.e., you know, kind of the buzz is creating, well, let's start from the wrong direction, as you guys know. It's starting, um, you know, we're seeing companies that want to analyze um, viral customers and, and be able to treat them in a differentiated fashion because certainly they would have more value, and so being able to allocate and go back through all of the different uh, networks to determine the most viral, if you, you, know, you read the book Tipping Point, that kind of stuff, it, there's some really interesting work being done there. I, I don't know that the results are out yet, but I've definitely seen uh, customers who are very interested in investing and doing that. Um, I'm also seeing um, things like um, uh, attribution and digital marketing. So. You know, digital marketing, uh, by most studies, is now up to 12 or 15 percent of marketing spend and growing. And people are just buying, you know, place ads and and search optimizations, all that kind of stuff, and, and spending wildly. And it's kind of an arms race. People are really trying to understand when I converted a customer, how did I get that customer, and what are all the touch points that I had with that customer, not just the website that they clicked on before they came here, because that's important in terms of the total package. And so those kinds of problems. Uh, we're seeing um, people wanting to jump up and solve. And then, of course, Golden Path on, on conversion to revenue through, uh, through web blogs and, and through your website is, is an important one. So those are some of the early ones. You know what, I think in five years, I think there'll be 100 more, and we're just figuring out what they are. So, uh, you know, with this viral customer thing, they're actually, so uh, two colleagues of, in the marketing department at Wharton um, are, have always been really interested in social networks. One is um, Raju Iyengar and the other is Christoph Van de Bielta, who's been studying social networks for 15 or 20 years. And um, they have a, a data set that's physicians prescribing a drug that's a new, newly launched drug where the physicians um, have nominated people that they look to as thought leaders in their physician community. And some of their initial data would indicate that um, there isn't this one or two or five viral Physicians say in that particular social network um, that that the you know your your influence is really local, and um, it's you know it suggests that there might be it's not that we want to find the five or six viral customers we want to find the ten percent that are most influential sure. and it's we're still probably going to be playing some kind of mass marketing game with those people we're still going to be trying to compete to, to that group as a block um, but that it it's not going to be this like I find the opinion leader and I get him to use the product and then everything is going to That's certainly tip. not one. Yeah. That sounds really useful though. If you can isolate the, the few percent, 10 percentage of a large population to find the influence. Oh, for That's sure. That's a tremendously for sure. valuable thing to do. 
Great. I'd like to shift gears a little bit and talk um, specifically now about the financial services industry. Um, Steve, maybe you could speak to uh, you know how analytics fundamentally changed what happened in the financial services industry, um, where you see it headed, and, and if that provides any kind of uh, um, uh, learning for other folks in other industries in, in terms of looking to understand how they may uh, evolve in the future. Yeah, well, I, I think most people know, at least I, I have a, it's my opinion that a lot of the predictive analytics had its roots in financial services and the banking industry primarily, and even more specifically in the credit card industry. Why? Because there were mass decisions need to be made that had high leverage. S you know, small improvements had tremendous dollar value. So all the, all the, the, the requirements were there to, to, to drive uh, sophisticated improvements in the system, and I think Fair Isaac was one of the uh, uh, the, le the leaders in this field when they when they built their first credit score. So they really are a pioneer in this, and they and it was so successful it, it blossomed out into many other things. HNC with the uh, with a successful Falcon product for credit card fraud, the transaction fraud prevention. So financial services spawned a lot of of the key revolutions in predictive analytics. And the, the reason is simple. It's, you know, it's where the money is. That's why you, that's why you go to the banks. And that's where the money is. So, because small improvements make a huge leverage. And it's, the, 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 the banks have just continually gotten more and more sophisticated. The bureaus grew up around this. And uh, data collection, data use have continued to get more and more sophisticated. And it's branched out into other large-scale industries, telecommunications, insurance, are making better informed, uh, more sophisticated analytical decisions. And it's, it's also had its wave on Wall Street. You know, there, there's a lot of algorithmic trading now. I think ten, even 10 years ago, there wasn't as much as there is now. And it's gotten to, I mean, remember, I don't know if you remember the prediction company with Don Farmer out of Santa Fe. I mean, that was back in the mid 90s when they made a big splash on using neural, well, it wasn't neural nets, but it was using predictive technology for, um, for stock pricing. And it's just, it, 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 it's gotten more and more sophisticated. Time scale is much, more, much faster now. So we're now doing uh, 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 tick data, sub-second trading decisions for algorithmic trading. And there is money there. And the people who can successfully crack those nuts, and there certainly are uh, strong technologies there, can make a lot of money. Where, where, <laughs> Um, well, I have a little controversy. I don't know that I agree that it began in the financial industry, but that is one of the industries. I, I, the way we see it, at least from 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 our install base, and financial was definitely an early pioneer. But it, it tended for us to be uh, businesses that were in a business to consumer business, where where um, where the product that they were selling is exactly the same as the product their competitor was selling, and where the margins were five percent or less. And that's what drove analytics, because then if you can turn it a tenth of a percent, that's a huge return. And so financial services certainly is one, but also telecommunications and um, general merchandise retailers mm -hmm. all have those same traits. And, and we definitely saw it kind of grow up now from a different perspective. Certainly uh, financial was more about risk management and, and optimization of that versus product optimization mm -hmm. for retail versus network optimization for, for telcos. But you get the idea is, is, is they had that, that driving business need and it was very competitive. You know, where we have seen, at least where I've seen laggards has been in, in other industries like you know, pharmaceuticals where there's a big barrier to entry, the product margin is 99%. So there are bigger fish to fry like distribution, R&D, things like that, so analytics kind of can take a back seat. Um, and so we tended to see that, and I'm seeing that now even with the, with the change of direction and some of these newer data types, I'm seeing the same kind of behavior so e-business certainly is a driver. Financial services is a big is a big driver of some of this new uh, of wanting to pull analytic content from these new data data types. Yeah, I, I would I would disagree. I think financial service was the beginning of it. Certainly, well before consumer product marketing and uh, and insurance and things like that. But it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> and telecommunications is actually a laggard in this. Field. I will say our first customer was a bank and our second customer was a telecom. Yeah, yeah. and I'm talking <laughs> 40 years ago, too. I'm talking 30 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but but that, that's all right. And so uh, 
is that kind of a good guide for who, you know how we sort of see and should view the adoption of, of some of these techniques? I mean, you know, are we going to now look at sort of the uh, you know the things that are you know grossly profitable, low transaction type of volumes, and sort of say, um, boy, that's you know that's where the because again, some of these changes to me, what's exciting about them is that um, it, it provides a lot of the you know before you know. You, you need someone of mass scale to be able to afford the investments in mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to opt or optimize, you know, Walmart, Walmart's, um, you know, you know, store or distribution network, right? Um, now, you know, a, a ten-person company can build, a, you know, an HR platform that kind of optimizes uh, the, uh, the the hiring and the, the human resource management of you know Fortune 500 company, um, you know. It, that that's sort of what's interesting is that you know, I I I understand that there was a reason, and I think that maybe part of the change that we're going to experience now is that the economics of this are going to make sense across a lot of different spaces, and you know the fact that you know individuals, I mean literally individuals can you know who are motivated and well informed and educated, you know can begin to build models that make a difference. Um, so, you know. Uh, I think that's kind of one of the paradigm shifts that, that I'm, I'm observing, and I think that um, you know I, I think that that's what makes it particularly exciting is that I can see this <coughs> pervading almost every type of industry, every type of application, um, and that's what makes it so interesting. There, there's a proliferation of sophisticated toolkits that are available for that, that are cheap. There are uh, tremendous solutions to data collection, aggregation, and storage, and interaction. Uh, so these tools are now accessible to everyone, uh, or, or virtually everyone. So um, it is much easier for a one person to start up a little consulting shop and start building models. You, you know, I would agree with the, the thin margins kind of drives you to it. Um, it's, and it's sort of the combination of the thin margins plus decisions that have to be made over and over again. Like there's thousands of these decisions that have to be made and so it, it make, you know, automating, automating anything yeah. that you have to do a thousand times kind of makes sense. You'll see, and um, we, we actually talked to, we, we did a trip to um, Asia last year and, and specifically to China and there wasn't a big appetite for it. Mm -hmm. Even among retail, financial services, you know, areas where um, you think there would be appeal because it's the same industry and they just say mm -hmm. we're making money hand over fist and it's about opening up new branches. Like we can make money so long as we hang out a shingle. It's a so it's, it's a labor. land grab and they don't really need to optimize it yet mm -hmm. because they don't labor's have competitors, cheap. labor's cheap, I can hire smart people to make these decisions for me instead of automating mm -hmm. it. And so. Yeah, in Asia, do you guys have client, big clients in Asia that are trying to do this? We do. And they it's are, they are interested. Friends, and oh, they okay. are interested. That's great in here. financial services. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's becoming a lot more, it's a big growth area in Asia. Financial services and telco, very competitive. Interesting. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we were mostly talking with retail and they were yeah. really not interested. <laughs> yeah, they're Just, building up the infrastructure and right. collecting the data. So they're okay. getting ready for it. Mm -hmm. They're not quite there yet. I'd like to shift a little bit now to uh, incumbents dealing with this transformation. Um, I'd like to get your thoughts on uh, how how companies deal with this, if they can deal with it effectively. And, and my and the, and the reason for this question is that um, I was up at the uh, Wharton Alumni Forum in, in, in uh, San Francisco over the summer, and uh, there was a gentleman who was on a panel by the name of Andrew Trader was one of the founding members of Zynga. And he had a fundamental belief that if your company was not built on, you know, kind of with analytics uh -huh. as sort of a yeah. central competitive advantage, that you were basically set up with I.e., if you sort of said, okay, I've built a company, now let's go find some PhD to kind of figure out <coughs> the analytics side of the house, um, that problem. And I gotta believe that there are a lot of industries out there that you know, maybe have touched on this a little bit, but have not really come to fully appreciate kind of the magnitude of the revolution here. And uh, my question is, have you seen companies successfully adapt? Um, or, in fact, is this a process of creative destruction? Where you're actually creating you know, a brand new breed of competitor. 
um, that is sort of from the ground up, filled with analytics in mind? You know, I would extend the comment that you made that I think it's a combination of analytics and strategy. Right? Analytics for analytics sake won't do anything. Um, analytics backing a strategy that's flawed will simply make that strategy fail faster. So I really do think it's a combination of those things and being able to create, frankly, create a feedback loop between them to drive uh, the company, uh, you know, the company or the industry uh, where you're competing. And, and certainly, we've seen examples of that um, of, of our customers doing that, where they, you know, effectively change the industry that they compete in by, you know, their ability to um, collect, analyze, and take action on data in real time. And they so they tend to set the bar. Well, we, we believe very strongly in that, and I, I always have for the past 20 years since I've been in this field. And when we started ID Analytics, for example, um, we called it ID Analytics. You know, we didn't call it ID Scoring and ID Data, and it's all, Analytics was core to the philosophy of the company. Because we had been through a couple of, of other startups, and uh, we knew the value in creating, uh, wrapping sophisticated analytics around large data sets to solve Difficult business problems. So yeah, I think it's a I think it's a fundamental um, uh, 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 differentiator for companies. And then there's and there's large companies that have difficulty making a transition from their current infrastructure, which is mainframe based and you know slow and cumbersome uh, IT projects and, and rolling out new technology. It's very hard for them to keep up. So yes, I think sophisticated and nimble analytics wrapped around. Ex, you know, ex, excellent data um, storage and collection is a differentiator. So we work with a lot of these large incumbent type organizations, often in a case where like the analytics team has kind of brought us in to be a little bit of muscle behind them, in, so to speak. And um, what I've seen, so oftentimes in these companies, decisions have been made by people. And so when you start talking about we're going to do some modeling, we're going to, you know, have these people get this idea, it's, it's, it's exactly the same as when factories were automated, where the factory floor workers were like, we're not gonna have jobs anymore. Mm -hmm. And it turns out, you're gonna have better jobs. So your jobs are going to be less <coughs> mundane, less guessing, and I've found that in the incumbent organization, if you can get them through one feedback loop, and then all of a sudden they realize like, okay, now I get this information and it helps me do my job better. I still know my job is to make the decision, but this data helps me make the decision, this analysis helps. If you can get them just through one successful, you know, and I've often strategized to like, let's stack the deck so that this works well the first time out. You know, let's work on a problem that's not counterintuitive to them. Let's work on one where the data is gonna confirm their intuition, they're gonna do what the data says and then, and then you get them through one positive feedback loop, and, and then they're ready to, you know, they, then the app, you know, once you turn on the appetite, it becomes voracious. Then they're screaming like, we gotta get rid of these mainframes because it's, I can't get the answers I need quickly enough. So, you know, the, the trick is to have them, you know, sort of taste the success once, and, and you know, then it'll take off. In, in the big incumbent organization. And I think I think agility is a key that, that you all hit on, and I think that's definitely the, one of the biggest trends that we're seeing. And uh, a couple of our customers, one in particular, I'm thinking of that, that's really leveraging analytics, has actually created an internal social network around their analytics department and deployment, where people kind of show off the latest thing that they found. And so the whole thing has taken on a life of its own, where people try to outdo each other with their analytics, and and you get all that creative talent in kind of a competitive environment. And it's completely different than you would think of analytics 20 years ago with you know a bunch of uh, statisticians kind of running some mainframe programs and every six months they do a report, right? It's just a very, very different thing. Great. Well, I, I, I want to hit on one more topic. Uh, we have about 15 more minutes of this panel and then I'd like to open it up to uh, folks in the audience. And I've saved the controversial topic for last. You know, so here we are in this new environment. Um, it, uh, the clouds have parted, and we've sort of all seen the wisdom of, of making <coughs> analytics a core part of uh, the competitive advantage of our organizations. But let's talk about some of the dangers of this revolution. Um, you know, will the incentive to create insight outpace kind of the, the, 
controls that we can actually put in place, and this is true of any technology, of course, but, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I turned, you know, the, the concrete example is I was reading the other day that Google bought a uh, face recognition company called PitPat. Um, it's based on the Pittsburgh, uh, the University of Pittsburgh developed some facial recognition technology. And one of the researchers at the firm had actually developed a way where you could use the, the technology that Google purchased in conjunction with a person's picture to guess a good portion of someone's social security number. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you know, how much of this are, are we, the consumer, willing to take before there's a real kind of pushback to sort of say, oh, you know, not too happy? Or the worker, for instance, you know, gee, not too thrilled about uh, the analytics that they're doing on my performance or, you know, the analytics that are uh, uh, you know, just constant monitoring of, of what I do 24 hours a day, where I am, how I'm driving. Uh, you know, there's data collected on me 24-7. Um, is there a risk that we kind of go too far, or have we just kind of gone past it and we there's a point, we're at the point of no return at this point? Well, well pe consumers want relevant things, good decisions presented to them instantly, very, very quickly, and wherever they are. That's what consumers want. They don't want to see a bunch of junk that they're not interested in. So they do want to see presentations of information, whether it's proactive or reactive that are relevant to them. And they, they don't they want it immediately and they want it everywhere they are. They want it to be totally connected. But there's there's a creepy factor to that too. <laughs> when you know you, you see something presented on a website that's related to something you did yesterday that there's no way they would know about. They should know about that. Uh, so there's this really creepy factor. So there's this consumers want it, but they're also a little bit frightened by the, the ability for, for it to be delivered sometimes, especially when it's very, very well done. So there's this kind of dichotomy in a consumer's mind. Uh, you know, they're, they're concerned about privacy, and they're concerned about, that's the primary thing. The other side of that is security. But privacy is the primary thing that consumers, so they, they have this kind of a, um, uh, you know, a two-sided um, problem. They want relevant things, but they don't want you to know too much about them. I think context makes the, the biggest difference. So if you, you know, if you have a favorite store that you like to buy clothes and the clerk there kind of knows what looks good on you and what kinds of colors you like and starts recommending, you know, hey, we got something new in, or even calls you at home and says, hey, we got some stuff in that I think you're going to love. Why don't you come in before it sells out? Um, that feels right. It seems like it's a normal part of our interaction, our business relationship with each other. When, it, when I think companies go wrong is when they start using the information beyond the context of the, the consumer's expected business relationship. So when, when I have a business relationship with Google where they deliver my email, I expect that to be sort of like the U.S. Postal Service. The U.S. Postal Service does not read my mail. They keep the, the letters sealed. And I expect that Google is also not going to read my mail. And then when they give me an advertisement in the side of Gmail that reveals that they are reading my mail, I think this is outside of the context of the business relationship that I thought we had. So I think it, you know, it's all about connecting to sort of older analogies that people have for that business and what they expect out of that business. And, you know, I fully expect that my tailor knows my measurements, and it doesn't bother me, even though I, no one else on earth knows my measurements, right? <laughs> but so your it, examples are on the landline world. Now, what about the online world? You know, not your tailor and your and your personal and the people at the, the clerk at the store. So how do you deal with how do consumers deal with that? So I think you have to. What was the the sort of anal analogous service that people were were receiving in the online world? It gets uh, Facebook might be a little bit hard. Like, what do I expect Facebook is listening mm -hmm. to or, or not listening mm -hmm. to? But if you think of that essentially as a messaging service between friends, you know, I don't expect a messaging service to read the messages. That's not what messengers are. Don't they're not supposed to read the messages, mm -hmm. right? So. Um, and, and most other services are have some there was that that need was met in some other you know physical way. Well, what do you think people are comfortable with with respect to recommendations, shopping recommendations? I think if it's within the context of what they know the business to offer. So I know that Amazon sells books and a bunch of other stuff, and so when they make you yeah. know these cross category, but if they were to start sort of. 
um, selling my data to a financial services company who starts recommending me insurance products, I'm like, wait, Amazon is a company that sells stuff. I don't, you know, I have it. And I think it's just going to take careful research for companies to know what the scope of their their business relationship. Google is, you know, in, in great danger of getting into a lot of trouble with this because they offer so many different services. And is it my expectation that my Gmail data is being used when I use, say, a Google Docs application? And that it, do I expect Google to be kind of sharing information across those channels? So you think it's mostly about sharing? Improper, what you would, a consumer might think of improper sharing of data, either within the company or with other companies. Right. So it, maybe I'm extending the analogy too far, but if the consumer is, um, you know, say I don't expect my tailor to talk to my butcher, right? Yeah. Hey, I noticed she's getting fat. <laughs> <laughs> Recommend some leaner meats, right? That would be. <laughs> and then if the butcher says, hey, I was talking to the tailor, like that's weird, yeah. right? Yeah. The question is when you have this big Uber company that is both a tailor and a butcher, right. um, you know, what is my expectation about the sharing of data between those different, different silos? But to me, it's about like the amount of information you can have about me is the information that's relevant to our relationship. Uh -huh. You know, I don't, it, you yeah. know, if we we have a relationship about, you know, something that has nothing to do with my family, then I don't want you to know about my family. That's that's mm -hmm. private. That's right. But if you're providing childcare services, well, then by all means, you should know about my family. I think you're also starting to see a lot more companies try to self-regulate. Maybe not some of the examples you used, but either with opt-in or different pricing schemes. So mm -hmm. certainly there's a, an economic impact to uh, Google about being able to use your information and redeploy it, which offsets the cost of the service they provide, if you're willing to pay for that and be more private. I mean, I think you'll start sure. to see more tiers of that. And, and certainly in a lot of the open source communities, uh, you know, last week in a, the, uh, a government agency donated a bunch of uh, security code to the open source for Hadoop just to be able to track you know, row level and cell level security for that purpose. And I think you'll see a lot more innovation in that space because people will start to backlash. And they'll, and they'll backlash with their feet and their wallet. Sure. And that's the only way. You can't regulate it. You could. But, but and the car, and like, so I, I, I spend a lot of time in the auto industry, and there was a lot of discussion about putting these data monitors in cars to understand what's right. happening with cars up to the time that they, basically black boxes mm -hmm. for cars. And the car companies just wouldn't touch it. We're very afraid of it. Now you see the insurance companies have said, why don't you sign up for a we'll, fee? We'll, we'll lower you your price rate. if you'll let us watch what you're doing. And and it hasn't been very controversial. I don't know what their take rates are like, but, but they're not getting that media pushback. So people are generally OK, you think, with giving out some additional personal information if they get some kind of economic benefit from it. I, I would agree with that. Either money or a improved service. Right. It's interesting, you know, uh, the last question, and I don't think we need to go there because it was just more of a, um, just sort of a, a way to poke fun at the, everybody's saying there's a bubble out there. Um, <clears throat> but in the context of this discussion, um, I was going to ask whether you all felt that Facebook was worth $100 billion, which, um, you know, at the last round of investment from Digital Sky Ventures, uh, that's sort of where you know, we're approaching. Is, is sort of the billion dollar mark for Facebook. And I'm just wondering whether these valuations are going to drive companies to be a little bit less scrupulous about you know, how, where, who they kind of provide the data to so long as they can try and monetize it. I mean, we're, on the one hand, we're trying to, <coughs> there's a, a, very, a very strong incentive to kind of stay within bounds, but then at the same time, these guys are being pounded for you know, ever faster, ever greater results, growth, profitability, et cetera. And I think that one of the dangers of it is that it's going to cause people to push the envelope in terms of you being able to say, you know what, we're actually going to uh, not monetize this data. Uh, we're going to restrain ourselves um, for the good of their brand. And certainly there's going to be some brands that can afford to do that, and there are going to be other brands that just can't because it's either that or in both. So that's just sort of an observation that um, I think uh, you know some of the bubble talk, which is you know it's it's uh, quite trite, but um, I think has relevance for uh, the discussion about privacy. Okay, if there are no other comments, um, what I'd like to do is uh, open it up to the uh, the audience.
question uh, relates to how good our models are. And taking a look at the financial industry as an example, as a bad example, we have the uh, models underlying derivatives, um, not just mortgage-backed derivatives, but derivatives generally, that I would say are highly questionable, um, and that were a contributor to the uh, crisis that continues to this day. Um, so we have all these data. Uh, are our models good? Are there problems with them? Do we understand the dynamics uh, that we're modeling? Uh, what are the uh, blind spots, if any, that we might be uh, suffering from? Yeah. I think there's a fundamental um, uh, misunderstanding about what models are. Uh, people think that models are some kind of a predictive, smart thing that can learn from past experience and then predict the future. And to some extent that's true, but to a large extent it's not. A model is simply, or in, in general, it's, a, it's, a, it's fitting a functional relationship to past data. So you're given some data, and it has some kind of relationships between an input and output. You know, you're predicting interest rates based on past history or something like that, or a stock price tomorrow based on well, everything that's happened at this point in time. So, so you build this functional relationship. That functional relationship is trained with past data. So it assumes that the relationships going forward are the same. And that's what a model does. Fundamentally, it, it, it assumes that the functional relationship, you find the functional relationship, and to the extent that you believe your model, you're believing that those functional relationships will stay the same. That's not always true. You know, the world changes. Sometimes it changes, uh, it always drifts. That's why you retrain models. Sometimes it changes changes um, dramatically and those functional relationships break down and people sometimes forget that models aren't that smart all they are is in general is fitting past data in a broad sense so don't forget that models can be wrong so I have a question and this is um, I want to choose my words carefully because I want to be sure I'm not too controversial I think I get it um, so Ellie says, well, this is not about data, it's about decisions. And Stephen makes a comment, well, it's about making money. It helps you to make more money. <laughs> so at the end of the day, I mean, not to be overly dramatic here, but this sounds like a very tactical area of study. And it's another arrow in the quiver from a management perspective. But it doesn't have any real strategic significance in terms of the business model of a corporation. You're not finding, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm offering a statement here for you to push back. I hear a lot of discussion about tactics and analytics and improving and tweaking and refining the model. But what I don't hear is how data or data analytics or predictive analysis is somehow going to push up into the strategic mm. echelons of a company and fundamentally change the way business is conducted. Now, is that a true statement? I mean, the, the way I see it is, you, you know, you're talking about talent out there. But I see, and if you talk about organizational management, the talent you're talking about is going to be forever consigned to the ranks of a director and not a vice president and certainly not a CEO because, frankly, you could, anyone can do data. It may be a dis decentralized model where it's just, you know, everyone is, is responsible for looking at and analyzing data. Or you may tag one director level employee within an organization and say, God damn it, you're responsible for looking at the data, make sure we were doing proper analysis. But I don't see it pushing up into the executive ranks. Well, I, 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 there, there's some so to what you say. Um, a lot of machine learning and, and uh, data analysis and modeling is tactical in nature. Improve this process. Give me another 5%. Uh, uh, cost savings here or a profit in increase. A lot of it is. Perhaps the bulk of it. But much of it is company founding. Lots of companies are founded, especially uh, there, there are people in this room who have founded companies. So, so take out social media and take not, out it's not just Facebook social and media. Twitter. I'm saying, I mean, let's talk about fundamental brick and mortar companies where so, they're making airplanes so and furniture. Here's what's radically, like one of the things that's radically changing because the tactic, tactics are enabling it. So I agree, like you know, 90% of the day-to-day -day work of analytics is tactical work, but sometimes being able to automate those tactics makes new business opportunities available. And the, in the case of marketing, 
um, and specifically advertising, you know, we're going from a mass marketing world to a one-on-one -on -one marketing world. We're actually kind of going back to the old days where there was a salesperson who targeted the advertising message to each person individually, except we're automating that. Um, and, and that opportunity of communicating in that way with customers is just, you know, changing the whole advertising strategies of companies. So they're, you know, they're not doing, you know, new companies are not doing the big television buy they're, because they're focused on more targeted advertising strategies. So that's the interplay, you know, whereas when those tactics all of a sudden make doing something possible that wasn't possible before, you'll see kind of whole new business models are, emerge out of, out of, you know, now we can do this cheaply for thousands and thousands of people. So let's, you know, now we have a new business <coughs> Well, and it's not just within a company, but new, as I said, new companies. ID Analytics was started that way. There was a, a growing problem of identity fraud, and no one had a solution. And we built a company specifically designed for that, aggregated data specifically for that, and built targeted analytics in a very sophisticated way, sophisticated way that solved that problem and solved it well. So yeah, it can't be strategic. I think I think take it up a level. Um, uh, you know, not necessarily tied specifically to the new data, but just data and analytics in general. Definitely seen it in um, mega retailers today. Mega retailers, are, it's really important to have the right product in the right place at the right price, treat customers well, all of those normal traditional retail things. But the retailers that are most successful are absolutely the world's best distribution management companies, bar none. It's not a retail domain expertise. But having the data, optimizing it, and realizing that it, it creates a competitive advantage has changed the retail industry. Think about um, cell phone carriers, uh, the same thing. Cell phone carriers got to have the network and you know good coverage and all that kind of stuff. How, how do they differentiate today? They're actually really great retailers, and they provision the right phone in the right place for the right price for you as a customer to keep you from churning. So I do believe that actually analytics do get into the C-level suite, and that gets back to that whole tie-in of analytics to strategy, and how do you really drive your business strategy knowing everything that you need to know about your business. So definitely it, it scales up to that level. Think about uh, one example that, that we will sometimes use. Uh, if you're a retailer and you've got one customer and you've got one product, you're very intimate. You know when to have that product on hand, and you know what your customer is going to pay for it, and you know what it takes to keep that customer happy. How do you scale that to where you have 300,000 products in 3,000 stores with 500 million customers, and have the same level of precision on where do I need to have that product at the right time for the right price so that I can sell it? And, and analytics enable our, our companies to scale. And they also enable uh, companies to be more competitive and, in many cases, change the industry that they plan. Now, the flip side is they don't often want to talk about it. It's a competitive advantage. So finding some of those use cases can be difficult, but they're out there. I mean, the examples I gave you, they're very generic, not tied to one company, but you can see those things happening in business. They didn't happen um, by accident. Um, and, and these things are very strategic, um, even thinking about, um, you know, what we take for granted today is a fixed rate, fixed rate cell phone plan that works in any of the 50 states. I remember my first cell phone. If I went out of Philadelphia County, it cost me like four dollars a minute to use the thing. Right? Um, how do you think those decisions were made? And, and I mean that the competitive analysis. How am I going to go take market share? How am I going to profit from this? How am I going to optimize the pricing plan? All of that stuff is driven by analytic content. It's not driven by dartboard. And and so I would say, yeah, I think it is in the sea level suite. It just may not be some of the tactical examples that we use. Excellent uh, comments. Uh, to follow on to the question is that somebody said earlier, and I really agree with it, that analytics value is maximized in an agile organization. And that implies that it enables organizations to adapt better to complexity. How do you find organizations overcome um, the resistance to change to embrace analytics. In other words, there's a tremendous amount of resistance to to take your sentiment to further extreme of like, let's just put these guys in the analytics box and not use it as part of our strategic decision making. Yeah, well, I think I think you could answer that well, but I would just say it starts in the culture, and that starts at the C it starts at the CEO and the board in a company is understanding the, the potential value 
uh, tactically and strategic of analytics in the company. But I think you've probably seen a lot of examples where uh, you try, you you've sold your um, very sophisticated product into an unsophisticated company. Uh, well, I'd like to say all of our customers are sophisticated. In case this video gets out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but seriously, no, I, I think um, uh, a couple of things happen. Some, some actually have the strategy, and so I've seen uh, customers and non-customers who are prospects of ours who have that strategy, and, and they really get it. And, 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 you know, there are a good number of them. There are others that I see that uh, have been the victim of a disruption or a dislocation in their industry. And they're playing catch up, but they know they need to because it's the only way to really survive. And, and that, that is definitely uh, a case that happens, frankly, in, uh, in uh, tougher economic times. I mean, the financial meltdown and uh, some of the things that we've been going through economically recently have actually driven more interest in analytics than ever. And it, it, it's almost perverse. I mean, we're not happy about all of those things happening, but it's been very good in driving analytics to the forefront because people look at it and say, gee, who was asleep at the wheel when we were running these derivative objects? Well, you know, everybody actually knew that if home prices didn't increase, these derivatives would be worthless, and the model would tell you that. But, but it, it didn't close the loop. So sometimes it takes a disruption, sometimes it takes intense competition. Uh, and sometimes um, it is companies that are found on that strategy, and I see all three of those as cases of people who adopt uh, who adopt these uh, analytics. I did, wanted to get back to the the discussion around some of the influence in marketing. In consumer marketing, there's a lot of use of modeling to decide how you're going to uh, promote a product at a certain price. And I'm curious about your thoughts on how we sort of think about the network effect that's come out of some of these new things like Facebook and, and, and not necessarily that tool, but that concept of social networks and how you can, how you might tie that into the traditional approach of using models in consumer marketing. So there's actually a lot of work going on, on specifically that area. Um, so, you know, given that there is this network structure out there or, you know, people are studying, given different network structures, how do these messages propagate across networks? Where's the right place to start in the network to get the message out? And this is a very hot topic in, um, you know, in marketing in general, in the academic community specifically. Um, and and it's it's not really any different, right? It, it's it's essentially the math. It's just contingent on that network structure. So given that this network structure and these are how messages pass. Um, this is, you know, and this is the probability of someone saying something along to another person. You know, all that stuff can be predicted. So there are people building predictive tools about how messages propagate throughout these kind of marketing social networks. Yeah, I would agree. It might be more difficult collecting data, though, putting the monitors in to, 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 to measure the transmission of things. But I, I agree with what you said, Shelly, the same. So um, you, bring, you bring up a good point. Uh, earlier, you, all three of you mentioned Asia and kind of a specific interest in China where most of the network is controlled or monitored by the government. And I'm curious to see um, what kind of observations you have within the market there. I mean, would it constrain you collecting information in any way? Or even in, that when you're on the ground there talking to people, how, how do the retailers there or any other customers there, how would they respond? How do they manage? So we, work, we actually work for the uh, catalog and physical store retailer in, in China. Um, and their data was far better and cleaner than anyone I've worked with in the US. Um, and the big, one of the big areas of growth in analytics and marketing is connecting um, the consumer from one place to another. And this is notoriously difficult to do in the United States. There's actually a huge, Experian has a huge business of trying to take, this company has two data sets and they don't know which people match and, and Experian will, will help you match up that data set. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, people are very nervous about privacy issues, so uh, a lot of times they'll do that double-blinded so that they can't, the company actually pays someone to, to match them up but not tell them who the people are. Um, and in China, uh, most retail, uh, so they had this beautiful clean data that tracked people across retail, uh, online stores and catalog, and I, you know, I finally met with them, I was like, how did you get this? And they're like, well, every, where the customer goes, we ask them for their cell phone number. and and 
their cell phone number uniquely identifies them pretty much for life now, and so we have all their transaction history. I, I bet you have customers who would just drool over this. Like we could ask people for their cell phone number everywhere they go, and they would. And, and most the, Americans the, would say, "No oh, thanks." And, and and like this in this data set, everybody's saying yes. I'll give it. And so in general, it seems like an area where um, you know. Uh, People are more comfortable and less upset about the, the privacy issues, and you know the government is certainly not trying to regulate it very heavily the way it is happening in Europe and the U.S. They, they're they're able to connect customers across you know, long streams. Jenna, you had a question. Yeah, a question. One industry we haven't talked about yet is healthcare, and I think it's going to be huge for analytics because with health reform, we're mo moving towards these integrated, accountable care organizations, which in the past have been fragmented in their own little silos and now they're going to get bundled reimbursement and they've all had you know security firewalls on their data how is this going to help them because they're going to have to do more for less and they're playing catch up like the financial industry we were spending one percent when financial services were spending ten percent of revenue on it so it's late to the game it is yeah and their 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 uh, analytical services and products are not nearly as sophisticated as they are exactly and they're going to need to be. Yeah, fraud detection. I've, I've built some fraud detection for healthcare claims processing. And it's a, it's a hard problem. Um, it's easy to, to, to solve it uh, relatively well. But the, the data is, is, is complicated. Uh, there's all the, um, the, the uh, procedure codes and bundling and unbundling. And, and uh, you know, there's a lot of tricks that people do in fraud. But it's... Um, uh, I would say, in my opinion, there's a lot of fraud in healthcare, and it's a um, it's a, 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 a problem waiting to be improved. And it's a great place for predictive analytics to to, uh, to provide a lot of value. We're definitely seeing it in the payer side, so that's where there's a lot of transaction-based data, whether it be uh, fraud detection, frankly, whether it be uh, pricing plans, or even um, Understanding how to improve diagnoses and treatments, mm -hmm. you know, based I, on large statistical yeah. sets. Um, what what what's kind of interesting is on the provider side, you know, people and um, companies that are providers of healthcare are ne just now standardizing on electronic medical records. Oh, everybody right? has it. Yeah. And, and so it's kind of like you know the ERP wave went through commercial industry <laughs> in the '90s, and now analytics are big. Right, healthcare is going through the equivalent of ERP now, right. so I definitely think it's a big deal yeah. coming because there'll be more sources, um, more data that we can build better and more accurate models against. Yeah. And huge opportunities, not just in fraud, but also in you know Consumption. identifying patient behaviors that like, hey, we need to intervene, and also in education, there's a huge opportunity to. Um, you know, track students over time so that you can figure out that something's going wrong or something's going right or we need to change change things. So, you know, there's both, you know, huge opportunities to kind of tailor the service experience over time um, using these kind of tools. Didn't I just read in the Wall Street Journal that IBM's Watson was going to be applied to well, some mm -hmm. medical mm -hmm. well, to make well, in the medical yeah, field to right, make recommendations on treatments. To if I could add to that, I think um, Kaiser Permanente is also working. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've got a massive data set to they're work with. They're way ahead. Yeah, and they're they're working on a very sophisticated predictive health modeling. Um, yeah, they've tool. been they've been working with the operations research yeah. community. Yeah. For and and I would, I would ask the, the panel what they think about um, Google's exit from their health product because I saw a lot of potential in that as a you know a very large community with a lot of um, a lot of data there. Um, why, in your in your opinion, did uh, Google leave that market? Yeah, I don't have that. I couldn't hear the question. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm just wondering what you, you think um, the reason for Google's exit from Google Health was, given the, the potentially massive data and potentially massive implications of that data successfully modeled. But this was going to be the um, consumer driven to your health information, right? Yeah, but they, they were also, they had a lot of data input from, um, from different devices, and they were working with health providers to get data in from their EMRs yeah. as well. So It's a nasty field. <laughs> you could go to jail if you don't protect the data well with HIPAA laws. I think so, that, you know, there, that, there's a lot of, of um, bureaucracy and infrastructure and care that you need to give to the data. So it's a, it's not a, it's not for the faint of heart mm -hmm. dealing with that data. Yeah. I, would, I would ask a following question. Sorry to, <laughs> to monopolize the conversation. Um, 
I think there's there's an ethical question as well, and I was discussing earlier with uh, one of your peers. Um, what do you feel is the ethical obligation of a company like yours if you find information, if you connect to a social network or you, you find out something about people within your data set? Um, what do you feel your obligation on that line is? Well, I spend most of my time thinking about fraud uh, because that's, that's kind of the core of our company as opposed to re recommending a, 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 a product or service. And um, so I face a related ethical question. I'm looking at, I mean, you know, lately I've been looking at, at uh, millions of people in the United States committing fraud. And I've got the list. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I look at these people by individual. I know who they are, where they live, and what they're doing. Now, what do I do with that? Sure. Do I work with law enforcement? Uh, that's not our company's business model. You know, we don't make money with that. But I, I'm facing a, 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 a kind of an ethical dilemma myself. You know, I've got a, I've got a list of millions of fraudsters. I, and, and what do I do with it? Do I talk to the FBI? Some of these are probably, they're, I, I know some of them are sex offenders living under aliases. I know, I, I, I suspect some are terrorists because they match to the OFAC list and I know where they are. So what do I do with it? You sell your, stuff, you sell your stuff to FBI and then you know themselves. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, our company owns it, so, the, you know. The, yeah, so uh, there are interesting ethical uh, uh, dilemmas that one faces when one looks at large amounts of data. Absolutely. So what's the yeah. answer? No, no one's talked today about these data mining tools are getting cheaper and cheaper, the data is getting richer and richer, transferring data and information. Who gets this information? Anyone in the company, what, what I'm challenged with in my company is that we have people who are getting this information and acting on it at a director level or above. And if you don't understand the end-to-end -end business process or what, these, what this data is telling you, you could actually misinterpret the data. Is there a data steward? Is there a data god? Is there someone that says that this data is coming from this source is correct? You know, if, if my business is growing and my losses are growing, I'm in the insurance business, does that, is that a bad thing or is that just a, a factor of the fact that the business is growing and the exposures are growing with it? And if someone says, oh my God, the losses are growing, we've got to do something about it, are they missing the point? Our, our typical successful customer will have uh, either a data steward or an office of data stewardship. To ensure that because um, to, the, to the point I made earlier if you have analytics driving a bad strategy you'll just go out of business faster sure. if you have bad data driving analytics driving your strategy you have the same problem so there is definitely the um, a large body of work being done around kind of the gold copy of data and you know what is defined as a sale what is defined as an order what is the you know and really getting that, and, and that is really an important thing because when you scale this thing out to point of decision making, you gotta make sure that it's right. And, and um, I would also say that doing that without an overall uh, data management and data integration strategy is completely impossible. It's hard enough to do it if you've got a strategy. If you don't have a strategy, it's, it's hit or miss. And, and you see that show up with some of the bad decisions that some companies will make because they just didn't know. We're gonna have time for one, one more, two more questions. Adam. So, I'd be, oh, <laughs> I'd just be curious, you know, there's, we've talked about, you know, new tools, you know, new access getting cheaper, getting easier. A lot of companies haven't started down this path at all yet. I'd be curious to hear what the panel views is sort of the low hanging fruit, where to start, what's the easiest place to dive in, or the most ROI place to dive in, so. I, the first place to start is save your data. <laughs> That's the first thing I do when I go into a company is, you know, we, we listen to the business problem and then we say, okay, let, tell us about your data. And if you don't have data, you know, so that, then, you know, then you, it's hard to start. Then you start designing a process to collect data. So the first thing you do is, 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 is be a good steward with your data. Save your data, don't throw your data away. Data is more valuable than disk. Okay. 
Disk is cheap. <laughs> data is valuable. Okay, save your data. So that's the first thing. And then you start accumulating sets of questions that you're going to ask. You're going to query your data. You are, I'm trying to improve business process. So I need, what do I measure? Okay, what are your fundamental questions that you're trying to answer? How do you measure it? Store data, collect your data around that. Is it about pricing? Who buys, what are my, my, what's my price elasticity around certain products? So just, you know, gather your questions and save your data. <laughs> well, you know, you know our, our, our typical prospect is um, in like the global 3,000 biggest companies. That tends to be the market that we target. And, and, and I would also say that in, in that instance, uh, I think they all have done something with analytics and Typically, the reason they'll turn to us is they either run out of steam in the solution that they built, or they had a point solution kind of mentality, and they ended up with a thousand point solutions, and the data didn't fit together very nicely, so they couldn't make any good decisions. So um, I think part of it is uh, part of what you said is how do companies get started? I think they've already started. Um, the big thing is that realization of gee, an integrated view of my world is really valuable, and that's where it really starts, and then, and then keep the data. And so one really good entry point for this, I think, is one well-designed experiment. So we've talked a lot about predictive modeling, and predictive modeling is, is great when you've saved the data, but you find yourself in a situation where you haven't saved the data, you have a good business problem. A good way to kind of learn the rigor of saving the data is to actually plan out an experiment. So you have some, you know, you find something where two senior decision makers can't agree on a course of action, and you say, okay, we're going to split you know, our customer base and treat one of them one way and the other the other way and see what happens. And we're going to plan ahead that we're going to collect that data, we're going to save that data. Um, and it's a, it's a good way to kind of get people a flavor for what can happen if we have the data and, and, and can, you know, compare things. And so I think that's a really nice, and anyone can do an experiment. I mean, it's really very easy to do. You know, you have a newsletter switch the lead articles for half the people and see what happens. And it just gives you a flavor of how, like, all of a sudden you can get information and, and, and that can drive your business. Great. Last question, Ken. Certainly. My, my question relates to an observation about yeah. models that potentially may drift over time or based on different data sets. So without getting into the definitional issues of common sense and judgment, <laughs> at what point can predictive tools actually start to learn? and learn from, um, from their mistakes, and then is it a limitation of the data that's available to them? Is it a limitation of judgment? I mean, what, what are the trends in that area? Well, uh, there are architectures of models that are learning. They're online learning models. What, they, what you do is as new data comes in, um, it, it recognizes that new data, and especially if there's a functional input-output, if you have the output for that, it will learn that. And it will, so the models will drift, and they'll drift with the phenomenon appropriately. So that is a, a very workable um, uh, process that's been around for 20 years. There are problems with that because you, you have to monitor your models to make sure that they don't become you know, drifting wildly as new data changes every day. So they have to have some kind of level of stability. So you monitor your models. They are learning adaptive models. So there are ways, but still, even with that, don't forget that all they are are looking at past data. So they're only as good as the data you've shown them, the past data it's seen. So don't ever think that a model is smarter than you are in the sense that it can predict something it's never seen before. Models only give you what they've seen before. And it's certainly not going to imagine something completely new. So you, there's no, you know, it's always going to be up to decision makers to come up with what are the options on the table. Um, and then it's the model's job to predict which one is going to be best. Great. Um, I just have a couple of uh, follow-on things. Um, to learn more about the work in customer analytics initiative, please Google it and check it out. There's a lot of ways um, that you can get uh, learning. I'll give you an example. Um, in San Francisco, on November 17th and 18th, they're actually having a, a hands-on kind of practicum on how to use some of the techniques that have been researched by the Institute um, and apply those in your business. Um, so uh, these are, you know, I've, I've actually uh, listened in on one on, on how nonprofits can manage, um, you know, their, uh, their customer bases and, and predict 
who's more likely to continue participating in, in you know, annual contribution campaigns. Um, this is, I think, a class has been modified um, to use a similar technique in terms of you know, thinking about customer behavior. And uh, I encourage anyone who would like to get some, you know, roll up your sleeves, get your hands dirty, use real data, use an Excel spreadsheet to really get you results. Um, this is a course that I would highly recommend. Um, I'd also like to make a plug for um, Peter Fader's book. Um, he is, uh, through Wharton Digital Press, publishing a book entitled uh, Customer Centricity Essentials. What it is, what it isn't, and why it matters. Um, I encourage you to, and we'll put this all up on our website so that you can get access to it later. Um, I would encourage you to check it out. He's going to uh, publish some ideas that are um, quite contrary to conventional wisdom, and I would encourage you all to uh, take a look at some of the, the primary research that he's done. Um, we're all about collecting data. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd really appreciate it if you could take the time to uh, fill out this survey and give us some uh, feedback. Um, and I encourage you to, if you're interested in events like this, to uh, follow us in any of the various media forms that you wish to uh, consume our content, whether that be website, Facebook, LinkedIn, or... Are you going to email this to us? We'll do that. We can do that. Looking for viral customer. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll talk about referral discounts in our next... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, with that, um, I wanted to give a very hearty thank you to our panelists. Um, these are folks that are extremely busy and have made... Uh, you know, concessions with their time. And as a token of our appreciation, I think we've gotten some gifts you for you all. They're Wharton. Uh, they're uh, Wharton paraphernalia, I believe. Ellie, you already, may already have one. <laughs> <laughs> Always like more Wharton swag. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Ah, awesome, thank you. So thank you all very much.